There were people of faith who were recognizing there was a savior who stopped the death and desolation. Mm. We don't have to fear anymore about who's going to come and knock down our door because I have to be sacrificed to some sun god, you know? Right, yeah. uh, This guy took care of it. Welcome back to the Anything But Quiet Time podcast. We are Rochelle and Carter. I'm getting lipstick off my teeth. I really hope the camera wasn't on at that moment. It's, no, it's on. It's on. Uh, Is it, why did like, you have to say anything? Because if people were wondering, what is oh, she chewing? You look like, like ungrateful, right? I just, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Get out of here. Get out of this you place. Uh, if you want to see, uh, or maybe you're like, no, I'm good from now on. <laughs> uh, but if you want to watch the podcast, you can. You text the word quiet to the number 893-893 and vice versa. You can get the Spotify and Apple link or you'll get the YouTube link. Um, something recently, you know, we go through the Bible here at the Anything But Quiet Time podcast. I very uh, carefully select when I'm going to try to sit down and read the Bible because I have a toddler at home. Mm-hmm. I won't get anything accomplished if he's around. You read the same sentence 500 times. Yes, you do. Especially yeah. if you're in like Deuteronomy. <laughs> like it's like, yeah. I'm picking up nothing. I got news yeah. for you. Even if you don't have a toddler around. <laughs> it's hard to pick up, right? Um, but I do want to set that example, especially as he gets older. And so I will try to, on some Saturdays, you know, pull it out and, and he'll say, I want to read the Bible. Mm. And so he uh, he sits down by me just the other day. He's like, I want to read the Bible. I want to see my name. His name's Ezra. And we've told him before his name's in the Bible. Mm-hmm. So we'll go to the book of Ezra. And there, there you go. You know, the, on the, the title page, it'll have his name, you know, bigger font there. And uh, then he goes, I want to see your name. Mm. Where's your name? Mm. And I go, oh, I'm so sorry, Carter. You know, yeah. my name's not in the Bible. Your name's not really on anything that has names on it. No, not the way I spell it. A C-A-R-D-E-R. My name's on nothing. Yeah, to get it. Special made mug. Uh, yes, you do. And it costs extra. Special made pencil. Thanks a lot. Thanks for reminding me about that. <laughs> and uh, he goes, no, your name's in there. <laughs> and I'm like, no, it's not. And he takes the Bible and he all the way to the front, pushes all the pages over to the dedication part where my name's written in there. Aww. And he goes, there's your name. <laughs> I, like, I love it. How did you do that? I guess his mom's shown him that before. Yeah. But I had no idea like he was going to prove me wrong in that moment. So yeah. you're right, son. No, he is right. I, we actually shared a little bit of that on, on the radio show that we get to do. And this precious woman called in in tears. And she said, I have a word for everybody. After what his son said, you know, whether or not your name appears in the Bible, it doesn't matter. What's in the Bible is for you. Mm. So it might as well have your name in it mm. yeah. because it's for you. It's for everyone. Sure, sure. And I, I just think it's so sweet. Our kids can be so profound. And later, when you ask them when they get older, Ezra, yeah. do you remember that one time? No. Huh? I have no idea. What no. You, I. We got any more wings? <laughs> no. All right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. But I, I think that's really special. We get to take a... You know, speaking of kids, and my son is about to graduate from high school, which is all kinds of emotion. And I've told him that um, when it happens, I'm going to be a basket case. Yeah. You told him that for years, probably. And he doesn't, I don't know. He, he doesn't, doesn't know, what know what's with. coming. <laughs> He's just like, oh, okay. The day of reckoning. Oh, okay. Yes, we'll be here. Like if you hear, it's like wailing. <laughs> you know, like in, in Jewish culture, they would hire people to come and wail, to mourn with them. I won't need help. <laughs> You're just going to hear from this. There's thousands of kids in yeah. my son's class. Right. Yeah. But the one wailing. Yeah, and, and they get on the announcement. I, I'm so sorry. We said no uh, uh, horns. No, yeah. no. Uh, what do they call Let's those? Inclu- yeah, air little- horns. No air horns. I'm sorry. That's a lady. <laughs> It's actually, it's allowed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh my word. But so we, we went on a senior trip. He got to choose where we went. We went to Cancun, Mexico. Nice. Uh, it was not shabby. Oh, okay. it was not shabby. Good. We'd never done anything like that. The inclusive resort. The all inclusive. Do yeah. you want a Sunday at 3 a.m.? Go for it. Well, it's a 24 hour service. Oh, that's lovely. Uh, so we, we didn't do that, by the way. We you should have. Well, now we're judging you for not doing that. <laughs> You remember it's all inclusive, but these precious people also work for tips. Oh so, yes, that's true. Yes, that's true. Uh, how much money do you think you should take <laughs> tip the person at three a.m. for bringing your lazy behind well, a hot fudge Sunday? Yeah, you can go a couple different ways. All right, yeah. Anyway, so we we decided to take the two hour, two to three hour journey into. A, it's it's called, and I love how our tour guide put it. No, it's not chicken pizza. 
it's Chichen Itza. Okay. Chichen Itza is where you can find this incredible uh, pyramid looking temple. It's the Mayan temple. Yeah. A uh, ziggurat looking thing. And the stairs, you may have seen it recently in social media where the lady ran up the stairs and they were all yelling at yeah. her because you're not supposed to do that That's anymore. Right. And apparently like people before they made it like off limits, nobody's going up there anymore. People were like saying like Beth loves Jeff, you know, like. Really? Really? Yeah. This is a piece of history. We're talking thousands right. of years. The Mayans have been around. Th it predates Jesus 3000 years. That's crazy. And the Mayan culture is very interesting. A lot of folk, um, I think they're, they, if my tour guide is accurate and he seemed to know his stuff. In fact, his dad, his dad, I believe is German and his mother was Mayan. And he was a beautiful mix of the two with uh, red hair, dark skin, blue eyes. It was awesome. Wow. And what was really cool is that on our tour, he could speak German and Spanish and English. That's crazy. And he could do it all. So he was helping us all figure things. It was, it was really remarkable. But anyway, so we're on this tour and I'm thinking this is going to be so cool. And don't get me wrong. It was. But it was also really troubling mm -hmm. because everything you look at connects with death. E everything you look, including the temple that you're looking to, you know, that this was erected towards a, you know, to a God the sun God, mm. uh, this just side note, I think is very funny when people came looking for gold, the people there, they would pick up these pieces of gold when they would find it. And apparently it was in good supply for a while. <laughs> they would pick them up and it just looked like a blob. And they're like, the sun God pooped. Wow. And they called yeah. it sun poop. And so when, you know, <laughs> Europe comes over and it's like, do you have gold? They're like, <laughs> Poop. Wow. I mean, it was not of any worth or value. No to commodity. Them. No uh, commodity. Interesting. But the amount of, of sacrifice, human sacrifice that took place. Uh, in fact, this is fascinating. There are 32 different dialects in Mayan culture. 32 dialects. Now, if you go to Jersey and you go to Boston and you go to Houston and you go, you know, you're going to hear different accents, but you're not going to get a whole new dialect. Mm. So w these people were constantly fighting for borders and things like that. And they would constantly fight each other for territory. Okay. That was value. Land is always valuable. And they sometimes, instead of going to war, they, they showed us their like ball court where they would play ball. And there was like a stone hoop that was on the side of the wall. And in this area, they have the largest of any of these found. And it was absolutely fascinating but basically, uh, the kings would be like, you know, instead of going to war, let's just take, let's, you know, let's play some hoops. Really? Now, who do you think would die, the loser or the winner? I mean, I think that's obvious. I think it's 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 obvious. It was the loser. Yeah. And if there are small ears in the car, this this part of the storytelling today is not it's not fun. It wasn't fun to hear. But yeah, there you see a person bending. It was an honor to serve their country. This was an honor that I am now going to be beheaded. Mm. And then you see other uh, pic, uh, pictorial like representations in the stone. It's all engraved in there. There were other ones that were clearly, you are um, a lesser person because you're poor, you're in poverty, you're being forced into this position and you're going to be sacrificed. Mm. Uh, and then there's the position of the person who's like, I am so happy to die in this way, you know, playing ball, that's, that's a really hardcore sport. Yeah. And then there's this building over here and that's where the priest is going to be. And he's going to present the trophy instead of a championship trophy, instead of the Lombardi, instead of any of the, well, what is the Super Bowl one that we just went through? A Lombardi. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's yeah. the Lombardi trophy. Uh -huh. Yeah. Here's a head. That was the trophy. Here's a head. Oof. There's so many puns there. Let's avoid all of them. Right. <laughs> There were also in the culture um, Aztecs that came much later and fascinating from our tour guide. You didn't know you were going to get a lecture on this and I'm going somewhere with it, but um, the Aztecs were much more grisly uh, where the Mayans might, let's just like in comparison, it's like a one part bleach, 20 parts water, right? It's kind of mm -hmm. like that. They would sacrifice like one person to their bajillion people, mm. uh, 
breakfast, lunch, and dinner, their God required a meal, and it would be a human one. And so these people would be offered. And, I mean, it was horrendous living in that time. And so when the conquistadors come over, um, our tour guide, he said, I'm actually reading the letters between the head guy and the king— And there's really no conquering going on here. They're like, if you can get rid of these Aztecs in our backyard, this sounds pretty good. There was one guy who died for all of it. We don't have to sacrifice any more people. Sounds great. Where do we sign? Mm. They got rid of the Aztecs and so on and so forth. The, The way that they determined people dying, they arrived at that. I mean, they see the sun, they look up. This must be where we come from because the the biggest and brightest and most bold thing around them is the sun. So the assumption that this is the God that they must serve is there. How they arrive at blood and flesh needing to be sacrificed. Well, they believe that the gods are going to create people. So they start with clay, which was no good because when it rained, they melted. Mm. And then they tried wood and the wood was pretty good. In fact, the people got a little too cocky and the gods were like, no, we don't like that. And they sent a great flood to cover the earth and get rid of them. Mm. And then they decided we're going to make people out of flesh and blood. And now in, in, in response to the gods making us out of flesh and blood, we're going to give that back to them. And so sacrifice happens, and uh, which is interesting because it's so similar to what we see uh in the Bible, we know that human sacrifice took place in, in biblical days. Clearly, it didn't matter what what continent you're on at this point. People were thinking, they were of the mindset, we have to give back. Where does that come from? Where does the need to give back come from? Yeah. I think it's there's this, we are born knowing that our our natural position is in subjugation to a greater being that there is a creator, there is a design, there's some reason why I need to do it. Uh, And the connection uh, to Moloch is even greater in that. They would sacrifice children. It was only in the most dire of circumstances. uh, If if they were in a a great drought, they found the skeletons of children that would be sacrificed. They believed they were so clumsy because they were kids. The rain was stored in glass jars in their thinking. So they would send these children into the underworld after sacrificing them. The children then would hopefully break the glass jars and the rain would come down. Mm. We know that in the Old Testament, Moloch Moloch, uh, children were sacrificed to him. Uh, And it's really not until Exodus and the story of Moses that we start knowing who the true, who is this real God? Yeah, he starts revealing himself a little more, right? He starts, and and in fact, there was a belief system in God that he was above all other gods, Mm, mm -hmm. that these other people acknowledged there was some being over all gods. And it was Moses that encounters God the Father, and God says, this is my name, Yahweh, this is who I am. And he starts revealing over a process, doesn't he? There are no other gods before me. There is no room for idolatry. Yeah. And he starts explaining it. But weirdly, we have seen all of these similarities in culture. Well, and that's what I was going to say. Yeah, it's fascinating. You spoke to, we all have that, there's something above me. This innate thing in us that we're born with. And that's what, um, you know, fancy people call the general revelation Wow. Did your chair just break? I like crossed my leg in a really weird way and I just fell wow. five feet down. Okay. Hang on. All hang right. On. I told you my natural position I, was subjugation. So hang I was going to oh, just get you, you oh, have God. to watch. Okay. I, you never know what's going to happen on the anything but quiet time podcast. When you okay. text the word quiet <laughs> to the number eight, nine, three, eight, it was worth it just for that. Um, okay. But Genesis or excuse me, uh, Romans one twenty, Yeah. Says forever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky mm-hmm. through everything God made. They can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Mm-hmm. Now that is um, more in the context of the general revelation. Everybody is without excuse uh, for knowing that there's a God. Mm-hmm. Now that's why we still got to get the gospel to him that it's specifically it's Jesus. You know, he, that's the way to the father. But a lot of modern atheists will say, if you were just born on a remote Island, uh, your default setting would be atheist mm-hmm. because it depends on where you're born. If you're born in the middle East, you'd be a Muslim. If you're born in the United States, you're a Christian, but the default setting is atheist. Yeah. 
and it's clearly not true. It's not. You just go over the civilizations for thousands of years. There's always and been even some, if it is idolatry, there's right. some version of I there's something above me. They recognize that there is um like the why do you think we got kings in the first place? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, you even see it in the first few chapters of Genesis when Cain he goes out and he's concerned that other people are going to take his life because they're going to discover his awful secret that he killed his brother. And then you hear about some more guys down the line. And one guy even gloats like I killed 10 times as many people as Cain did, you know, and like, why is that a big deal? It's called status Mm. and it's called who's at the top of the food chain. And so we recognize that there is an order of things. Sure. Sure. Because somebody is worthy of that status, whether it's strength, whether it's money, they exude some sort of dignity. I don't know. Um, but we recognize it. Why? If there wasn't a natural order of something. Yeah. Yeah. And our natural position is to reverence. Uh, it, that's the desire to get us back into that place of understanding whose we are, who deserves all the glory. And as I was listening to this tour guide, which I don't know his belief system, he was so knowledgeable in so many things and I really appreciated his heart. Uh, he was talking about, you know, just kind of flippantly saying, well, you know, when the Spanish conquistadors came over and they're like, well, this one guy, he sacrificed for everything. That sounds like a good deal. It kind of sounded callous the way he put it. And it could very well have been a callous thing for some involved. But clearly Catholicism gets set up hugely in Central America, mm. into North America, we see it all throughout South America. You know, there were people of faith who were recognizing there was a savior who stopped the death and desolation. Mm. We don't have to fear anymore about who's going to come and knock down our door because I have to be sacrificed to some sun god, you know? I, right. Yeah. I, this guy took care of it and it started there. And it's such a simple thing. Uh, and, it's also interesting because I would like cringe every time this guy would talk about, you know, oh, and they cut their heads off. And why is this platform filled with skulls? Well, you guessed it. Mm-hmm. They were cutting heads off. And why is the symbol of the the serpent involved? I couldn't tell you. Clearly, when they saw that, when they came over from Europe to try to, you know, get into this new land and find gold and things like that. And don't get me wrong. A lot of bad stuff took place. A lot of bad stuff took place. But... um they saw the serpent and they were like, this is, this is Satan. This is what we're seeing here. This, this iconic figure has always been connected in scripture with the dragon, the serpent. And so they immediately associated the two. They were looking at it as a positive creature. I've also heard uh, that uh, very close to this area, people migrated from Asia into this area and you'll find ancestry roots from hmm. Asia into this area. And Asia upholds the the dragon as a good thing. So we can't always like deem something at face value. Even to step back and look at the people, the Assyrians. Look, I'm not giving anybody a hall pass here for human sacrifice. It's not okay. It's pagan. And deep down, I think when you know life is in your hands and you choose to give that life away, hmm to a pagan God, this is not all right, no matter what anybody tells you. Yeah. If it wasn't that way, why would the Mayan people have been so quick to sign up for the, the religion that says one guy just did it for all of us? Sure. Yeah. Because this sounds good. Yeah. This is good. And now why would, why would one be better than another? If, if there was true, no, no true, morality, right. no true objective morality for us to go, this, this is right. This is wrong. Otherwise it just wouldn't matter. And they didn't want to kill the children. The umpteen yeah. skeletons that they found of adult people sacrificed when there was no comparison. I, I believe he said there were about a hundred children's skeletons. Doesn't make it any, any less horrific, mm. but it does kind of tell you where their mindset was. This is a last resort. Why should it matter unless morality exists? Right, right. So right. I, I found it fascinating. It drew me closer to the Lord and more grateful. Uh, you know, I walked the beach of Cancun, falling in love with God and just his goodness and his seeing his people. Yes, you know, 
we look at the culture um, from the perspective of even the Hebrew people, we're looking at the outsiders in a, in a different tone, in a different light. We're the chosen people. You're the other. Well, they were chosen because Jesus would come through that, that line, mm-hmm. right? But the others were taken care of. And we read that all throughout the Old Testament, that there would be one that would bless all nations through your line, Abraham. And that's Jesus. That's the Mayans. That's the that's the Aztecs. That's the Assyrians. That's that's you. That's me. That's everybody who's ever done a weird, rotten, why would you do that kind of thing? <laughs> that's Jesus for everybody. And and it kind of hopefully changes my perspective, even on history, looking at people in disgust. Yes, look at the thing as disgusting. That is sin. Mm-hmm. That is twisted and and perverse. But the people, there was something there in the nations that he would send his son, that he so loved the world that he sent his son. And that can be our focus always, you know? It's good stuff. It's uh, a lot of crossover with what I got to uh, teach in Sunday school and just really present two options of Noah's Ark and the flood. It's very interesting. That yeah, they, there's the flood. Re- there, I've heard of records of elsewhere of mm-hmm. a flood. Uh, but it was, um, in fact, I just want to make sure to give a shout out before I forget and not give them credit, but the YouTube channel inspiring philosophy is, uh, a fascinating, well-versed individual that, um, talks about this stuff and is a Christian guy, but gets into some of this. Okay. Let's look at, was the flood actually global Mm -hmm. or was it a regional flood? Yeah. And I didn't even know there was a potential option in that. Uh, okay. until a year or two ago. Yeah, I've heard of both, but I'd be interested to know what his take is on it. Did I mean, but you grew up only hearing the whole world, the whole right? World, I did. Because that's what you read in scripture. Yeah, it says all the earth, things but like that. You will also read as, you know, I'm, I'm reading uh, over the exodus of the, the Hebrew children right now, and they're going through all these plagues and they're saying, and all the animals were devastated. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All the animals are gone. Well, then why do cattle appear a little bit later? Right, right. Why does the firstborn of even the cows die in the 10th plague if they weren't all taken? So you have to kind of go, oh, wait, there might be, there might be different, Meanings. Meanings behind, yeah, there's different like sounds with the Hebrew alphabet. And hyperbole is allowed as well. As well as hyperbole. And I think that's what's fascinating. You know, I was talking to a friend that he doesn't believe Genesis. Who was this? Oh, no, I know know who it was. I mean, it doesn't matter. But a friend of mine said he, he doesn't believe we're reading actual history until, or literal history until Exodus. Mm. And he's a Christian guy, but he doesn't believe Genesis to be very literal at all. It's like a narrative of... Of very symbolic, yeah. very, you know, and um, now he believes in a regional flood is what he believes. And so wh- I really just kind of threw out the options for people in my Sunday school class to just reconcile. And my main point was a lot of these Old Testament, you know, Sunday school stories can be the thing that keeps you from pursuing. Mm. You go to your new job and you start talking about faith and you're good on Jesus, but then they say, you really believe and gathered up two of every animal? Yeah. You really believe that, and name the, uh, the, you know, Jonah and the whale, you really believe that a guy would have survived a whale? And then you, I think the tendency for people can be to go, I don't really want to try to defend this because mm. I don't know about it. Yeah. And I just think- And if, if that's not true- Then then follow suit, and right? And you know the word is supposed to be true. Right. That's where people can go with it. Uh-oh. Yeah. So I just think that digging into scripture and really seeing what it says yeah. is, is key. And then you just pre- at least present yourself with a couple of options here. So one is um, the global flood that you read all the earth as literal- and that it literally was, you know, and one of the strongest verses is like uh, chapter 7, 19, somewhere in there. It it covered the peaks of the highest mountains on all the earth, right? Well, you would think that to mean this was a huge flood. There it is. Everybody but Noah, it was wiped out and all that stuff. But then on the other side of it, it says, I want to destroy all of mankind. Mm-hmm. Well, that's not literally true. Hmm. Here's Noah and his family. Yeah. It even says, I think it's at some point in chapter six, I wanted to destroy every creature. Well, that's not literally true. How do we take that then? Hyperbole is allowed. Mm-hmm. I want to start clean. I want to start fresh. I want a clean slate here. Uh, sin is so rampant that we need a a new start. But does it, did he literally mean everybody? Well, clearly not. Um, and so 
the phrase all the earth is a phrase used a lot that doesn't necessarily mean the globe. In later in Genesis, it's like chapter 41, Joseph, the Technicolor Dreamcoat Joseph, <laughs> uh, he's in, in Egypt leading the way and uh, he, you know, the dreams and everything, he knows that a drought is coming. He's uh, stored up all this grain and all that stuff. And it says all the earth came to Egypt to buy grain. Well, not all the earth, right? We know that, for example, his own dad never came, right? His dad stayed back of where he was living. Do we expect that if there were Australians or, you know, Chinese individuals or do we, did they come to Egypt? More than likely not. We're, we're talking about the region. We're mm -hmm. talking about the area. And so you just kind of start to reconcile a lot of this in your mind and go, okay, if it was a region, mm -hmm. then it makes sense about the animals. It would be regional animals that would come. But if it was a region and not globe, then wouldn't Noah have just needed to migrate? Why would there needed to be an ark at all? Yeah. Of course, God can do whatever he wants to do. So if he chose, oh, I want there to be an ark, then there's an ark. Uh, but an interesting question still still posed there. And what, and one interesting thing, it's one of those chapters, it, it's incredibly, it's one of those when you read the Bible, if you're to try to read through it in a certain amount of time, it's one of those you skip over quickly because it's just genealogy. Yeah. <laughs> and it can be rather boring sometimes. But I think 10, Genesis 10, is a very good insight into at least presenting an option that we're talking about the region here. Because it lists uh, Noah's kids and grandkids and great grandkids and how we got to the Canaanites, how we mm -hmm. got to the and it's and the and it says it lists the nations of the earth, and all it ever talks about is the nations in that area. Mm -hmm. Where was Canaan? Where was you know? And mm -hmm. all of those. And so it's like okay, well, if that's the context, then are we literally talking about the Mesopotamia area? Mm -hmm. um, and so. You know, if you want to look at inspiring philosophy, that's that's a take. He's he's a regional flood guy. Yeah, I think there are strong uh, and I how I grew up too, but uh, but strong arguments on why it could be a global flood, including what you presented today. Yeah. Uh, now, obviously, what does that mean? Where did people go and when? What, was there literally were they literally in Mexico at the time of the global flood, or would it have been people that migrated there later but had the record of? I mean, I think there's all sorts of like we don't know questions. No, there are, and a lot of people have guessed. People who have studied the planet have studied the shape of the continents. And the what they all connected as one at one point, and maybe right. the flood was what helped disperse them. I mean, there's all of this, and I, I think because we can get overwhelmed and bogged down by questions, we forget to rest in the peace of the answer, mm -hmm. which is, which is God knows. Yeah. God yeah. knows. And, and I know that sometimes not having answers can, it, it can offer up some doubt right. in your world. And look, it's, it's pretty incredible. The, in fact, we've shared about this in podcasts past. I know that you've done a lot of intense work, in rec especially in talking with people of different faiths, in, in the fact that Scripture is the most historical and accurate document that we have that dates back as far as it does. Right. That there are more manuscripts and more copies of this. I, like Homer, the Odyssey, you know, the Iliad, these are some pretty old books. Yeah. And we would probably, the things and the histories that we know about them and surrounding them, we've gleaned from this. And this is what we look back in history and say is so. And yet it is such a fraction of the quantity and the historical accuracy of we know of the entire, the entirety of scripture and hold it less so. Yeah. Well, I mean, like what you're saying is like the Homer and the Odyssey, we have like 12 copies, 20 copies, something like that. That's it. We have thousands of copies of the Bible. And even to, just talking about the letters between the conquistador and the king mm. to help us it understand, was this really about conquering people? Uh -huh. Or was this more about a, hey, sign here and we'll take care of you? Okay. We have the letters to help us figure that out pretty easily. Sure, sure. Just a few letters. As opposed, well, is there anybody else documenting this? Was this etched in stone somewhere? Right. How do we have, we listen to that and think, yeah, that two and two, two plus two equals four. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Well, okay. So the, we need to start, we need to start allowing scripture to be more accurate than maybe we've given it a chance and also recognize that here's a, a really strange analogy. All spiders are arachnids, but not all arachnids are spiders. Uh -huh. Let me explain. There are going to be times where you see certain words in scripture 
And all of those things will mean this, but not necessarily the other way around. Mm, and mm. when it comes to translation and things like that, people have gotten as close as they possibly can to help us maintain the truth of scripture. Right. Right. And it's integrity. Uh, and so I think making sure, like when you say all of the earth, was it, was it just Mesopotamia? And what if it meant all of the earth with the flood, but doesn't necessarily mean it here with the famine? Sure. Sure. I, yeah. Hopefully my silly analogy would kind of like, oh, I could see how, and I don't know, I don't study languages, but the syntax of that one and this one, you know. Like, yeah. Yeah. No, that's true. It right. might be a little bit different. So uh, anyway, I think the things that Jesus has revealed to us in the light of day we should never doubt in the middle of night, mm -hmm. in the dark times of our life, or when people bring these things before us and make accusations. I know that I have been stirred by those moments in my life of doubt, and they have brought me to my knees. And my dad said this simple line one day and said, Rochelle, when it comes down to it, if you could imagine a world, a lifetime without Jesus, would you even want to live in it? Mm -hmm. No. So is it that okay to live that blindly? Well, some would call that faith. And um, I've seen enough evidence for faith to be a thing in my world. I'm, I'm good. The, um, the thing about, I think, with subjective evidence and objective evidence mm -hmm. is that uh, one is, you know, what God's done in your life. Yes. And that may not be evidence for somebody else. You know, if they, especially if they don't know you, and especially person, if they're analytical and they need to see it on the right. written page, but even a stranger that's on an elevator. Yeah. Well, I, I used to be a negative person. Okay. Yeah. They, they, they're not yeah. going to Now, If they've known you for 40 years <laughs> right. and they've seen the difference, they may, it may mean they can something. speak to it. Uh, but that is, that is evidence for you though. Yeah. You know? And so it's not a, I, people have said that it's not a blind faith. You know, biblical faith is evidence. And one of those for yourself is what has God done in your life? Yeah. Uh, but I, I really think- Which I, is disputed. In, to my to, point, to it's mean? disputed. It's like, it is a blind faith. People, but you're just ignorant. You're choosing to close your eyes to what oh, is accurate. Oh, naysayers say that. You're right. You're Absolutely. Right. But it's not, well, I'm not ignorant and, and let me say this, in my belief system. Tim Barnett with Red Pen Logic, I got a chance to talk to him and, and he presents why biblical faith is not blind. Mm -hmm. he, and even, even well-meaning Christians will point out a verse in Hebrews and say- well, it's just, we just don't know. I'd take it on faith. Mm. Well, a, a good uh, a, a definition of faith is putting your trust in something that you have good reason to believe is true. Mm -hmm. And if God has acted in your life, you have good reason to believe it's true. As well as what you brought up, more of the objective evidence. If you have trouble with some of these stories of Noah's Ark or whatever, look to what Rochelle was talking about with the complexity of scripture mm -hmm. and the fact that we have so much of it we have so much history about it and we can, you know, it dates back centuries where we know that it was written by eyewitnesses or people that they knew. Absolutely. And that is history, right? When you look at why we know Alexander the Great existed or Genghis Khan, or it's because of attestation is the fancy word. And that's what we have to go on. And if you can't get to that point where it could, you know, a lot of people do with the Bible. How am I supposed to believe something that was written thousands of years ago and who knows if it even happened? Well, then you can't believe anything right. before photo and video. And now you can't believe even with a photo and video because it may be AI, it may be Photoshopped. Like it's like, well, and so that yeah. that is how history has worked for thousands of years. And into your point about Hebrews and talking about the evidence of things unseen, uh, again, noting that it is evidence uh, and that it was something that happened to you and maybe not be experienced by others. Mm -hmm. uh, there are still uncovering things. There's still yeah. digging yeah. stuff up. Totally. So my kids have even come to me and asked, well, the Bible says this, but it's been noted in history that that didn't happen mm. or it didn't say, and, and it's confusing to them. And as it should be, these should be raising these kinds of questions, especially if it could be a stumbling block for them in their faith. Sure. Sure. That's evidence against, right? Not for. And I, I think the best answer to those types of things is they haven't dug it up yet. Right. <laughs> I think that's true a lot Give of the time. Give it a decade yeah. or maybe two. Yeah. And they're like, oh, we found more evidence to support this particular biblical thing. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. But we're not ready to concede. And like, how many things do you need? Right. You have six manuscripts of Homer's Iliad. Right. Right. How many things do we need? And so- 
at some point, it's common sense. As Lee Strobel said, it takes more faith for me to not believe anymore yeah. than to finally go, this is real. Yeah. Yeah. No, and that's true. Other people say it's blind. Well, the blind man once said he was blind, but now I see. Yeah. And the difference between then and now was him. That's good. Uh, can I share two nerd facts about this subject? Uh, yes, especially if you used that really big word earlier that you used. Oh, your- attestation. Attestation. Well, I'm going to share a third one, okay? Now I'm going to share a third nerd I fact. I want that to be a new baby name for 2024. Uh, this is attestation, Is this price. little Addy? What's it short for? Attestation. attestation. So uh, now I'm going to share three nerd facts about this. This is evidence this. of Jesus, y'all. Yes, yeah, right here. Attestation. Mm-hmm. Attest, right here. <laughs> uh, one is that word. Um, so <laughs> 99% of scholars atheist scholars, any scholar of antiquity, of of that era, of biblical before, whenever. Old people stuff. Old people stuff. 99% of them, uh, roughly, maybe it's 98. How dare you? I know. They believe that Jesus existed and they believe that Jesus died a death on a cross. Yes. That's virtually, you'll hear atheist scholar Bart Ehrman say, that is a fact. Yes. It is a fact. The third that he rose again Mm -hmm. is obviously more disputed. Right, which is is the- Crux of our faith. Crux of our faith. It's And it's about half of scholars probably th- believe it. You know, half of scholars say, oh, they were hallucinating or mm-hmm. you know, whatever it might be their theory of why. <laughs> and yet it's this, somebody pointed this out. It's the same evidence for all three. <laughs> they believe, atheist scholars, for example, believe yes. that Jesus existed because of attestation. Yes. Because of like witnesses like his, you know, the disciples, but also like Josephus and extra biblical, you know, uh, writings. Right. They believe that he died a death on a cross Mm -hmm. because of attestation that Mm -hmm. he was written about. And yet he was written about and Mm -hmm. multiple eyewitnesses. In fact, 500 at one time saw Jesus walking around after he factually died a death on a cross. Yeah. And it's the same evidence and yet not believed. Right. And that's where faith comes in because now you're instituting, you're saying I'm going to believe everything that's evidence unless it's supernatural. Unless it's weird. That's weird. That, that's what they, yep. That's the reason they and, won't get past. It and weird. I think it starts when yeah. we're kids. When, when I think the first time you realize that somebody, somebody lied to you mm. and they robbed you of innocence in that moment. But you said, yeah. And so slowly, but surely that childlike faith is taken from us, which is sure. why if you don't become as like little children, you will never be able to enter the kingdom of heaven is what Jesus says. There's a reason why he says that. We have to get back to seeing with our heart sure, and our mind, sure. our mind's eye, if you will, and imagine a world where Jesus could be all of the above, hmm. not just two of the three, but all three. Right, right. Uh, the other two nerd facts are the first biography we have of Alexander the Great is written 400 years after his death. Mm, yeah. The Bible was written within, for Paul's letters, maybe yeah. 15 or 20 years after the death of Jesus. Sure. And the closer something is written to the actual events. The more accurate. The more accurate. So just interesting there. But we take Alexander the Great as actual history, and Why I think it was. Why are these nerd facts? These are good facts. And, and then, and then find, oh, there are a lot. Rochelle, of course, the only Rochelle. people who say that? Nerds. Nerds. There are a lot of people <laughs> who find it boring. And then when people say we don't have the original writings, do you know? We don't have the original Gettysburg Address. And it's not on a napkin. What he originally wrote. Oh, that's right. They said that it was on a napkin. It was this big fable. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Nobody knows where it is. where did those things come from? Wooden teeth with George Washington. (laughs) Where did that come from? I don't know. I don't know. It's awesome, but but, but wrong. Yeah. It's still taught in school. So thank you for your nerd time. And uh, (laughs) to catch up on past episodes, you can still text the word quiet to the number 893-893. 